So I woke up yesterday morning to the news of another terror attack. In fact, two terror attacks. There was one in Kabul and one in London. And as always in these attacks, my sympathies and my thoughts, and my heart goes out to the victims and their families. These, the news coming out of these places is of obviously unspeakable horror. And it beggars belief that anyone could support these kind of attacks. And yet our government, the British government, does support these kind of attacks and has done systematically as a tool of its foreign policy. In 2011, a vicious racist insurgency began in Libya and the British government supported it openly. Uh, it began to, the insurgency targeted uh, soldiers, police, African migrants and black-skinned Libyans. Uh, and uh, the British government led the calls for military intervention on the side of the insurgency, uh, calls which eventually led to a seven-month NATO bombing campaign against Libya, resulting in the total destruction and obliteration of the Libyan state, a once peaceful and prosperous state, and to the uh, seizing of power by uh, the insurgents. And the British government knew precisely the nature of the forces that it was backing. On the second day of the rebellion, this is around a month before uh, the NATO uh, campaign got underway. On the second day of the rebellion, it was reported in mainstream media that the rebels had captured around 50 African migrants, locked them in a police cell that they'd taken over, and burnt them alive. Uh, early reports from the early days of the insurrection reported uh, building workers from Chad, around 70 to 80, being hacked to pieces uh, by the rebels. And uh, this, this, this is the nature of the, of the insurgency that Britain was supporting. Uh, the involvement likewise of Al-Qaeda was well known. Um, for years Britain had harboured the uh, Libyan Islamic fighter group, uh, fighting group and its fighters, uh, sheltered them, given them refuge and so on in Britain. Um, and this group was the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Libya. Um, and its leaders, uh, its main leader Abdul Hakim Belhaj, uh, became the commander of the rebels forces in Tripoli, the Tripoli Brigade, um, so in, uh, which whose, his job was to coordinate with NATO the attack on Tripoli. So in many ways, Belhaj was NATO's leading uh, man on the ground in Libya. And this was the man who was the openly, openly the leader for 15 years of uh, Al-Qaeda's Libyan affiliate, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. So Britain knew exactly what, who it was bringing to power, it knew exactly the forces that it was involved with, the same forces that would go on to become ISIS, um, and it supported the rebellion. So where does Theresa May come in? Well, since 2005, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group had actually been proscribed as a terrorist organisation by both Britain and the US. Uh, and its fighters in Britain, many of them were uh, placed under what are called control orders, a form of house arrest. Yet when the insurgency broke out in Libya in 2011, the control orders were suddenly lifted to enable these uh, fighters to go and join the British-sponsored Al-Qaeda rebellion in Libya. Uh, the fighters included Salman Abidi, uh, the Manchester bomber, as well as his father. Salman Abidi at the time was 16 years old, um, <clears throat> and his father was a known member of the Libyan Islamic fighting group, uh, Libya's Al-Qaeda affiliate. So, the, um, who, who was responsible for this policy of, of lifting these orders so that these known Al-Qaeda members could go and fight and train in Libya? Well, control orders come under the remit of the Home Office, the responsibility of the Home Office, and who was the Home Secretary in 2011? Theresa May. So, Theresa May personally was responsible for changing the status of known Al-Qaeda members uh, including the Manchester bomber, uh, the Manchester bomber's father, to ensure that he could travel unimpeded and they could travel unimpeded to train and fight uh, in an Al Qaeda uh, led insurgency in Libya. And the same policy applied to Syria as well. But that's not all. Uh, anytime someone on the terror watch list tries to leave or enter the country, uh, automatically um, a warning is flagged up to alert the border control officials who can in turn alert the counter-terrorism police. So some of these fighters were actually stopped and questioned by counter-terror police. 
Um, <clears throat> but MI5 overruled them to ensure that they could travel freely to and from these training camps and so on in Libya and Syria. Uh, and literally, you can read about this. This is well documented. There's an article on Middle East Eye recently called Sorted by MI5. Literally, people would be stopped. These fighters would be stopped by counter-terror police because their names had triggered a warning. And they would literally get on the phone uh, to, their, to their friends in MI5 and MI5 would overrule the police to allow them to travel back and forth freely. Uh, <clears throat> and again, who is responsible for MI5? MI5 comes under the responsibility of the Home Office. So again, the Home Secretary, Theresa May, uh, personally implemented a policy that allowed counter-terror police to overrule, to be overruled, to allow uh, fighters, known fighters, often known members of Al-Qaeda, to travel freely between Britain and uh, training camps in Libya and Syria to go and fight and train uh, with Al-Qaeda and latterly ISIS and so on. So let's just recap here. We know already, we know that not only did Britain uh, turn peaceful and stable states like Iraq and Libya into failed states that have become effectively safe havens for terrorist groups. Not only uh, is Britain uh, maintaining an alliance and is actually the biggest weapons dealer to Saudi Arabia, which is in turn one of the biggest state sponsors of terrorism. <clears throat> it was uh, legal for the first two years of ISIS's existence in Saudi Arabia, for example, to actually openly fund ISIS. Um, <clears throat> not only did the British government openly fund, equip and train uh, fighters in these insurgencies in Libya and Syria, uh, insurgencies which it knew itself to be led by Al-Qaeda and associated groups, but we now know also that Theresa May herself actually uh, had a policy to ensure that counter-terror police could be overruled to allow the unimpeded travel back and forth between Britain and terror training camps. Uh, of, um, of, of fighters in Libya and Syria. And this included Salman Abidi. Salman Abidi returned from his final trip to Libya, uh, presumably his final training session with ISIS just a few days before uh, the Manchester attack. Now we know he was on a terrorist watch list, so this would have triggered a warning. But thanks to Theresa May's policy, this warning was overridden. So that's the state uh, that we're in right now. And the British government has blood on its hands without a shadow of doubt. It has already the blood of millions of Iraqis, Syrians, Libyans, Afghans, Nigerians, Algerians, Tunisians, Pakistanis and others <coughs> who have suffered from attacks by these groups. But now to that can be added that the British government has the blood of 22 Mancunians and seven more Londoners. The British government, the cabinet, Theresa May and her cabinet, these are these people are complicit in murder, uh, they're war criminals, and if the Nuremberg principles, the principles established by the Nuremberg Tribunal, established after World War II, were applied, then they would be hung. 